Good to be here. Always good to be here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Matt's Art Chat, my weekly series of podcast conversations about the arts with creators, curators, and art lovers from all over the world. Now, obviously, this episode comes after a pause in the series, uh, which came as a result of technical issues that I have not yet been able to solve. As a result, this may be the only episode for another while. Uh, uh, but I was just eager to put this one out there because the subject of this conversation is Pablo Picasso. It's always very exciting to talk about Picasso. He's one of the most celebrated artists of all time and one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. And the occasion for this conversation is a brand new exhibition that will be launched at London's Bastian Art Gallery on the 3rd of September. It's very exciting. Uh, the exhibition actually recreates his studio in Cannes in France, where the artist moved after uh, World War II. He had been based in Paris previously before then. But uh, what was he working uh, on while he was there? What media was he experimenting with? What did he actually draw out of the place Cannes itself? All of this and more will be discussed in this conversation with the art gallery director, Chris Craig. So it's a very exciting conversation for art lovers everywhere, for aficionados of Pablo Picasso's works. We will also be talking about art galleries in general. Obviously, this is a very challenging time for museums and art galleries. So we're going to see how Bastian has actually responded to the pandemic. And um, aside from that, you know, I'm happy to be back. We'll see if I'll be able to have another episode out soon as well. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Uh, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hi, Matt. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm uh, doing great. You know, you're in London. I'm currently in Prague. What's the situation like in London at the moment? These are crazy times that we're living in. They are crazy times indeed. But the sun is out today uh, and it looks like it's going to be a bit of a scorcher for the rest of the weekend. So um, an opportunity for people to get outside and enjoy some sunshine, escape the confines of their houses and apartments in the city. Absolutely. And, you know, Chris, we're going to be talking about a, a, an exciting exhibition that is set to be launched at the Bastion Gallery uh, about Pablo Picasso, the one and only Pablo Picasso. That's very exciting. But before we get into that, I would really love to kind of uh, find out a little more about you, because this is the first time that we talk. But uh, I'm interested in finding out a little bit about your journey. Uh, and um, the first question would be just how personally, when was it that you became interested in the arts? Uh, that's an interesting one. I mean, for me personally, my journey, I grew up in the countryside outside of London and uh, didn't really have a kind of youthful art historical education. So my my introduction to the arts was actually really my aunt, who was a, an amateur painter and watercolorist. And so as a young kid, I saw you know, sit leaning over her shoulder and watching her paint and then kind of picked up the bug for painting myself from that and sort of studied you know, fine art through school. And that was kind of what led me into kind of learning more about the artists that obviously preceded me. And that's where I end up now. So yeah, I, I, I finished high school and went to university, went to the Courtauld Institute to study art history and have kind of been lucky enough to to find a career for myself in the industry after graduating. Did you did you kind of want to also be an artist, or are you also an artist? <laughs> a failed artist, I think probably. I I had probably entertained notions of of grandeur uh, from at a young age, but then subsequently realised upon kind of encountering truly great art that that was not what uh, the future had in store for me. So uh, I, I kind of dedicated myself to learning about those artists instead. I'm I'm curious. Who were some of the painters that you uh, that really got you into painting? Uh, in regards to maybe famous and celebrated artists. Of course. Cool. So what is actually Picasso? Who we will talk about later on. I mean, it's difficult, I guess, for anyone to ignore his importance in the development of of painting. Um, but when I was kind of younger, I mean, like you know, in my early teens and working, I was I was a huge fan of uh, Anselm Kiefer, who I get to work with now uh, at Bassin Guy, which is a, a nice. Uh, a, real, a real pleasure and treat for me, but uh, I always I enjoyed the artists who had like a lot of uh, a lot of emotion and a lot of impasto. So people like Kiefer, Francis Bacon, 
people like that who like I really spent a lot of time trying to emulate with limited amounts of success. <laughs> yeah. And so let's talk about the gallery. Um, what can you tell me about it, its history and maybe its uh, mission? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, the gallery has been around for over 30 years now. Uh, it's founded by Celine and Heine Bastian back in the early 90s, and they had been collecting and working with artists from a very young age. Uh, Heine was the secretary to Joseph Boys. Uh, we still have a fine collection of Joseph Boys' works, and we did an exhibition of, of early sculptures by him in the gallery last year in London. Uh, which was a kind of unique opportunity to see a lot of these very delicate, precious objects uh, in the flesh in the UK. None of them had travelled to, uh, to the UK before, so that was uh, a real highlight. But they they were very active in the art scene throughout the 80s, 70s, um, and worked with Andy Warhol, people like Cy Twombly. Uh, the gallery subsequently produced the catalogue Resonate for, uh, for Cy Twombly, uh, edited by Heiner. Like I said, the gallery has always had an ethos of high academic rigor. Uh, that's kind of, it's about protecting the legacy of the artists that we work with and celebrating them, obviously, for their, for their genius and for their, uh, the legacy that they have. But it would also be about giving them the kind of support and giving them the protection that they need in what can sometimes be kind of very unscrupulous circumstances. Right, and I understand that the gallery also publishes catalogues, artist monographs as well, and it does have online viewing rooms. Right now, I see there's an interesting Vim Vendors exhibition. He's one of my favorite filmmakers. Uh, yeah, well, I see Vim. I mean, Vim's a fantastic character and a wonderful filmmaker, but his journey through photography is a fascinating one. And yeah, we're fortunate enough to have an exhibition of his Polaroids and other larger format photographs up at the moment, which will be running till the uh, end of the month and then and he's just yeah he's a wonderful wonderful visionary like he just has a natural eye when it comes to composing images and that's obviously evident in his films that he's made but when he works in photography he takes a very different approach because it's a very single-minded pursuit you have one man and a camera and he revels in the independence that photography gives him unlike filmmaking where he's part of a much larger team and the results are very striking because a lot of them really convey a sense of isolation uh, and i mean one of his favorite painters is, is the american edward hopper and you can clearly see the kind of americana influence and the idea of kind of isolation that comes that's in edward hopper's work in his photographs and you know speaking about online exhibitions and i guess also uh, isolation to a certain extent this prompts me to ask you a question regarding the times that we live in how would you describe the response how the gallery has responded to the pandemic it's thrown up some interesting questions uh, the biggest narrative of the last kind of three or four years with regards to the commercial side of the art and, and the academic side to a certain extent is is how do you embrace technology how do you use online platforms virtual reality podcasts even like how do you how do you engage with people without them being physically within the gallery space and that has been sped up like the the transition to online material has been so drastic in the last six months since the kind of well really february time when it became apparent that there was likely to be an issue um, for the rest of the year, uh, and it's been it's been very very interesting to see how galleries have responded to this. I mean, we've done a number of collaborations with people. Obviously, we've adopted the online viewing room platform, which we've already discussed. Uh, but there is it's interesting to see how other people have gone about it because some galleries have decided that it's not in their interests to really engage, and there is a clear limitation to what you can really convey through an online platform. Um, I mean, there are great some great painters and certainly secondary market artists whose work, you know, maybe has to be considered in light of its condition as well, really need to be viewed physically. And just to understand, uh, would you say that the Bastion Gallery would have been active in the online world before the outbreak? We've been working towards it. Like I said, we're probably one of those galleries which has been uh, hastened into making a, a more concerted effort, more faster than we would have done. But there were plans in place for this year, which would have come to fruition anyway. It's, there are obviously good cost benefits of trying 
to host exhibitions virtually as opposed to physically in a gallery. So you have to be conscious of that. And also there are people who really collect art visually through social media or through websites like who, and there are artists as well who we can't ignore who are exclusively online artists and there isn't fabulous artists amongst them. Uh, and as obviously that has to be taken as the next logical step in art history that as with all art movements, the kind of change, change of technology and media has influenced art drastically. And so you have to consider the internet and computers in general as being the next frontier. So what's the situation now? Is the gallery in London open or will it reopen soon? We are open. So the gallery in London is open now on a limited basis. So we're open three days a week as opposed to five uh, with slightly shorter hours and then by appointment on the other days. But we will be reopening on, in September when we open the Picasso exhibition uh, on a regular five days a week schedule, Tuesday through Saturday. So let's talk about the exhibition. This is an amazing exhibition that is set to be launched, uh, like you said, in September. But let's take it from the top. And um, uh, I hope you'll pardon the simplicity of the question. Picasso is, of course, one of the most celebrated uh, and also famous artists of all time. But generally speaking, what would you say makes him such an important figure in art history? <laughs> Um, there is, uh, there's the slightly facetious answer to that. And then there's the more, more serious one. I mean, uh, his, his notoriety is kind of one of those things, which almost like a kind of Henry the eighth appeal of kind of, of kind of scandal and womanizing and all of this, which kind of plays into his, into his fame. But I mean, it is impossible to want to play the just pure raw talent that he possessed. His art that he met as a, that he produces a sort of 12 year old or 14 year old where he was able to reproduce old masters so faithfully is, is a staggering accomplishment. And then to take that talent and then be really at the forefront of every major artistic movement through the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and then in the latter part of the 20th century, up to his death to really still push the boundaries of what art should be so that he ended up influencing an entirely new generation of painters of the abstract mold in, in Germany is, is really, really remarkable. And there is no other artist who spans. I mean, he was 90 years old when he, when he passed away and like he's nearly a century of constant innovation and refreshing his, uh, his concept of what art is. And that has to be, for me in any case, the, the, the greatest attribute. And can you tell me about the exhibition itself? I mean, it's it's named Atelier Picasso, is that correct? Yes, it's correct. It's based around his famed Cannes studio, uh, La Ville Californie. After the Second World War, uh, which he spent so completely in Paris uh, and was followed around by the German Gestapo, uh, who tracked all of his movements and limited his access to supplies. And he had this studio on the, on the South Bank, which he filled with just collected detritus from the of Paris, and he continued to collage and make exceptional artwork. Um, but there's a kind of gray feeling to that period of his work. Uh, and when Paris is liberated, he moves to the South of France to Cannes, and he suddenly is imbued with life and color. And his entire creative process just expands exponentially. He's working with the Madura workshop in Flores to make ceramics, something which he'd never done before, but which rapidly became a mainstay of his artistic production. He's continuing to make assemblages and sculptures, but he also returns to painting because he suddenly has access to uh, all these materials which he was had limited access to whilst he was in lockdown, which is actually, of course, interesting in light of our current situation too. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I didn't think of that. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand that he was experimenting quite a lot with ceramic art. And I'd love to know a little more about it. I mean, how was he working with uh, with ceramics? Well, he discovered the Maduro workshop uh, when he first traveled down to to the south of France after the, um, at the end of the hostilities. And he at first was a layman in it. Uh, he had no formal training. He just liked the look of it, he liked the uh, owners of the workshop and he sat down with them to learn the basics and that kind of involved working with paints and glazes to just decorate already established patterns. And then as he became more comfortable, he did what he did with everything, which was experiments. And he decided that actually he could 
make better paints and he can make better glazes and that he could actually make better shapes and more and start to produce these kind of anthropologically shaped vessels of owls and of fish and of other birds and, and creatures from his imagination. And he would produce these either as unique works and there's a large number of unique test works which survive and others which are lost, which obviously didn't survive the experimentation. And then there are other series which he managed to produce in editions of up to 500, which an incredible kind of act of love in many ways, because he would sit and work on these plates and these vases and just paint away repeating motifs over and over. And there's always these subtle differences. But he, like a lot of the work he made through the 50s and 60s, there was a kind of a sense of, of honing down a motif and really working hard to, to find the perfection in something. There's almost like a platonic pursuit of this ideal form that he's trying to find in, in the repetition. So you mentioned it a little bit there, and uh, I think it's interesting to see that this exhibition sort of also shows uh, Picasso's love and fascination with animals and animal figures. Uh, so I was kind of thinking, what was it that you think he found so fascinating about birds, fishes, and so on? Well, he had an incredible kind of affinity for for uh, wildlife and for nature, and he had his pet animals, dogs and goats, and uh, he was kind of known, his biographers have stated that he was able to tame wild birds to come and rest on his on his hand and shoulders, and it's he, it, there's almost like an apocryphal idea of this, but it begins earlier with the work in the 30s, whereby he is associating with the surrealist movement and through that the kind of the, the stories of the classical mythology and these uh, incarnations and symbolic use of use of animals as motifs to represent desire or wisdom uh, which then starts to really sort of permeate his work and in the 30s he adopts the minotaur as his personal emblem um, and he sees this idea of the wild man this kind of caged dual form of the refined man and the wild creature within uh, which ultimately step stands for desire and masculinity. And then as he gets older, he approaches the image of the owl, which is Athena's animal of wisdom and contemplation. And he takes the owl to be far more significant in his life. And what's always interesting is from the 30s onwards as well, Picasso dates his work religiously. And he insists that it is not good enough to just see the work as it is. You have to know when the work was made and in what context it was produced. And for Picasso, an awful lot of this biographical detail focuses around the women in his life at the same time. And so you see the kind of use of the owl at the same time that he is working with the models of that. So that David, who came into his life in the early 50s, who was a 19-year-old, and unlike a number of Picasso's former muses, their relationship was chaste. Uh, and Picasso, whenever she would have come over to, to, to model for him, she would be accompanied by her fiancé. And this, there's a certain sort of change. I mean, Picasso is nearly 70 years old at this point. So, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's an older man and a changed man. Uh, and so you have this sudden kind of adoption of, of more wise uh imagery and it is impossible to look at Picasso's use of of animals as anything other than as uh, step-ins for human personality traits. I see you know it's interesting to think that even at his stage of his life and his career obviously he was already a well accomplished and celebrated artist but he still was experimenting with different media he still had that you know that that desire to keep experimenting uh, with other themes as well. I mean, uh, for example, what other media was he working uh, with in Cannes? Well, one of the mediums that he worked in very uh, widely was was metal. So there are a number of assemblages of scrap metal that he produced, but he also worked uh, he, to produce a series of monumental sculptures. Uh, you have the Chicago Picasso, which sits outside to Town Hall in Chicago, which is one of his most famous, but he also produced a series of like sort of 20 foot tall statues of Sylvette for profiles of kind of folded sheet metal. And that was something which a few artists had worked in, uh, in, in advance. And it's, it is quite important to say that Picasso quite often just appropriated other people's ideas. Um, I mean, one of his great maxims was, you know, good artists copying great artists steal. And he 
would see an idea and he would of course take it for himself and so metal works became one of those uh but his that kind of is an extension of his collage work that he was making throughout the early part of his career um even in his cubist works that was the, the first real experimentation in, in collage and then as i've already said during the the war years when he was limited with media, he would work in that again. So everything was available to him. I and mean, it wasn't just, he wasn't, didn't just consider himself to be a painter. Do you think that there was something about Khan itself as in the place that influenced his output during these times, perhaps inspired him in a particular way? Absolutely. I mean, the, like, the color and the life and the freedom of it, um, the sort of de vivre of being in Provence and having the rural France. And also he's, he's living in the, legacy of other great artists before him. I mean, his great friend and rival Matisse had come to the region in the 20s and had created his entire series of arabesques and obelisks, which inspired the later uh, painted series by Picasso in the 60s of the of Delacroix's Fabergés. Like that, that whole narrative is an extenuation of, of Matisse's legacy. Matisse died in 54, so he and it was uh, therefore kind of uh, instrumental in promoting the idea to Picasso. And then, of course, people like Cezanne, who was really Picasso's greatest hero artistically, particularly in his early part of, early part of his career, looking at Cubism, who had been born in Provence and had retir- retired there uh, and to paint and also we have the great series of Mount Saint-Fractoire and others which which captured the the light and the scenery and of course the impressionists as well had all worked down in, in that area. So he he was really living in uh reliving the life of all of his great heroes. And with that he was able to experiment for the first time and have the freedom to really relish the legacy that he'd already built for himself. I mean he was the greatest known artist in the world at that point, had been for many years. And he talks as well about being a living legend and having this, having people kind of come pay homage to him and make pilgrimages to his studio. And he was very open to being kind of worshipped as a deity, as it were. So he is, and part of that is this sunshine and the bright light that meant that he could walk around pretty much um, semi-naked and topless the entire time and just have this leathery skin and, uh, and, and yeah, just really just enjoy his life. And I think once you, factor in just the sheer amount of enjoyment that he had and the pleasure they took from his work, then you recognize all of that in in the paintings that we see and that survive now and the ceramics and everything else that comes with it. So he was well aware of his status within the art world. Yeah, he was. And it's interesting, there's a duality there and I'm careful kind of how to phrase it, but there was talk from the 50s onwards when you see this shift of art criticism focusing on abstract expressionism uh, in America and this move away from figuration that because it felt like he'd been slightly neglected by the, the, crit- the sort of the art establishment as it were but f- commercially he was still by far the most successful artist. You know, I'm thinking as well uh, what you mentioned earlier about this joy that he was experiencing. Perhaps it was also, you know, as a result of the fact that this was uh, in the period after the Second World War and whatever had happened, uh, especially in Paris, where he had been located. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, a, it's an interesting one. I think it's something that I, I, I'm i personally always fascinated by these kind of dichotomies, these transitional stages in artists' careers, whereby they are suddenly given new impetus. Um, the exhibition that we... that precedes the Picasso exhibition in London is a exhibition of the painter Hans Hoffmann, who was a German painter who taught the abstract expressionist painters in, in New York in the, in the 50s. Uh, and a lot of his work, his, the, the drive that took him into abstract abstraction was the violence of the Second World War. Uh, and so the exhibition the gallery shows the works that he was making during the war and then immediately after the war. And it's, and again, it's to say it's a relationship there that really fascinates me. And the same thing is, is, is true of Picasso because he had painted Gallica, uh, and had been celebrated for it, but also reviled by Franco's government and by the, the Nazi party for its political content. Um, I mean, there's a great story of him walking around Paris and having a Gestapo officer come up to him with a postcard or an image of, of uh, Gerlika, who and the, the officer saying, you did this, question mark, and, and because he said, no, you did. Uh, and it's kind of like this, the anger that he felt was and, his, and placing himself in Paris is very much an act of 
retaliation and of resilience. I mean, there was all sorts of speculation that he worked with the resistance, although none of it's ever been proven. And I think having survived that and got to the end of it and accomplished that ambition of kind of remaining in Paris, albeit with the help of the authorities, not letting him move very much, he was then able to take that as a sort of a personal badge of honor and then move on. Uh, and it's important to point say that this is not in itself kind of a unique moment. I mean, he paint, he has his famed blue period in Paris and then he takes himself away, moves to the rose period, takes himself out of that, moves to cubism, takes himself away from that, moves to neoclassicism, moves to surrealism. Like he's constantly in an act of reinvention. And so this is just one of those stages. The only thing that I would add is that at the age of 64, when uh, Paris was liberated, he is now at a point of being slightly more conscious of his own mortality also. Uh, so just moving on, I wanted to go, go get back to the exhibition itself and uh, what's it going to look like? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we are planning to recreate the studio in Cannes and it is a fabulous space. If you haven't seen the photos, of which there are a few, uh, I mean, there's good records of it, photographers, Good friends of Picasso, such as Andre Villers, documented it pretty well. Um, I mean, it was included in a number of publications as well. So there's a great amount of, of photographic documentation of his studio, which was a huge, grand room in the French tradition. And then he filled it with local rustic furniture uh, and mixed in with some high-end classical, like the 14th period pieces as well. And then his work. And his work consumes everything. He was a great hoarder and he also he was incredibly prolific. So his studio just bursts with life, with with paintings, with ceramics, with drawings, with prints, with posters. Uh, and we're taking all of that inspiration and bringing it into the gallery. And we will be placing works from all of these different media next to each other and trying to really capture the 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 sense of life and the creativity and the, the buoyance of his studio and his atelier. And you know, I'm thinking of uh, the photos as well. They they these I mean that's that's an important part of the exhibition, I think, in itself, because some well, something that I often talk about, even when thinking about, you know, contemporary artists, artists nowadays, perhaps this is an aspect of uh of their um a work or their being artists and promoting their works to the world that they tend to maybe underlook. I, I don't know whether you would agree as the director of an, of an art gallery that it is important to have such primary source documentation of the artists that work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I refer you back to what Picasso said, uh, you know, context is everything. And I strongly believe that. I, I think it's impossible to really appreciate. I mean, there are certain artists who will always have a, such an aesthetic quality that they are understandable in any to any generation but i really think that for the majority of artists the the experience or the so the setting with which the work is created is absolutely key and having that primary material to really explain the situation to someone who's coming to it um for the first time is absolutely essential and so we will have documentary photographs of the studio in the exhibition alongside the, like mingled in with the with the works themselves, which will be which you will see. I mean, there's there's certain works in the exhibition which are actually featured in the photos that we have. So that's in itself a nice a, a nice parallel. So how long does it take to just put an exhibition like this together, and where do all the artworks come from? Um, it takes a bit of time. I mean, we try to plan our exhibitions with a good amount of time in advance anyway. Uh, but this was something we've been working on since. Well, actually. COVID aside, we've been working on it since the end of last year because it was meant to be staged a little bit earlier in the year, but we've obviously had to push it back just because of circumstances. Um, so we've been working on this for about eight months uh, and we will be, yeah, need 10, 10 months or so once it actually opens. But it's, it's, there's a lot of work involved, sourcing, planning the concept and then sourcing the works. We're fortunate enough to have a good inventory of works, particularly in terms of primary material, the documentary photographs, etc., and ceramics. But then I'm also very grateful to collectors and other art professionals who have been willing to lend works to the exhibition to really help imbue a fuller sense of, of can, the Cannes studio into the our four walls here in London, which is no, no mean feat trying to turn what can sometimes be a dreary London high street into the south of France. But if the weather stays the way it is currently, then it will be perfect. 
And obviously, it's just a, always such a rewarding and fascinating experience to see these works uh, in the flesh, so to speak. So the physical experience as well is is quite important. Yeah, I mean, I've I've been very, very, I mean, I've been very vocal about this, and I know that my peers have been as well with this shift to online material. That there is no way to replicate the physical experience of seeing something. Uh, it is. It, it's not just to do with the physical object and the way that you can sense the surface or something or the tangibility of it, but it's also to do with the way that the human brain works and operates. You walk into an exhibition, it doesn't matter if it's you know a great retrospective at the National Gallery or if it's in a, a small commercial gallery somewhere in the world or even an art fair, like you do not view it in a binary linear sense of going from one to two to three like your eye immediately skirts around everything it takes in the entire atmosphere of the room that you're in and it and it makes its own decisions as to what you want to go look at first and what connections you want to draw between the objects and and that's the thing that can't be replicated online and never will be i don't think even with with good virtual reality presentations it's not it's too slow it's too artificial to satisfy the brain fully uh, and so I'm delighted that we will have, be able to be open to the public and allow people to come in and, and really experience the work as it was meant to be seen. I uh, absolutely agree with you there on the physical uh, exhibitions. So what are the dates for Atelier Picasso? So we open on the 3rd of September and we will run through until Halloween, the 31st of October. Excellent. Well, uh, I wish you all the best with it, Chris, and thank you very thank much you. for taking the time to talk about it. No, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a great time.